Good morning, everyone. I'd like to take you to another continent where it's warmer <laughs> <laughs> and back in time to the Inca, which were the largest civilization of the Americas prior to the conquest of the Spanish. And the one thing that uh, the Inca are most well known for is the idea that they were master stonemasons, that they were able to build buildings and walls with such accuracy that you couldn't fit, some people say, a credit card, but in fact, a human hair in between the joints. And some of these walls are 300 feet long. So my question on my first trip to Cusco was, how is it possible that they could do that? Because the stone that they used, uh, or stones, were andesite and granite and basalt. And all three of those are incredibly hard stones. They're on the Mohs scale, which is the technical scale, going from 1 to 10, going from talc, which is soapstone, and that's 1, to 10, which is diamond. Most of these are between 6 and 7. And in the archaeological record, uh, the only tools that are found are bronze chisels and stone hammers. Bronze is about 3 on the Mohs scale. So it's literally, um, it's literally like trying to saw through a log with a plastic knife. You can't do it because the material itself is harder than the tool. So that was my initial question. And what I seem to have discovered was that there were two civilizations that preceded the Inca, and they were much more highly technically advanced than the Inca themselves. And that goes counter to conventional thought, where civilizations always go in a, in a, in a line of um, increasing sophistication. But what seems to be not only in uh, South America, but also globally, is that you have cycles of time and you have cycles of civilization. So you have crests and then you have um, troughs. Um, and that's where, the, you know, that's where the Atlantis concept comes in. So this is the fanciful depiction of who the Inca um, originators were. <laughs> well, golly. <laughs> and this was, actually, this is a Peruvian artist. So what you have is you have uh, you know, Peruvian people and others who go, oh my god, they were, you know, they were gods. And then you have the, you know, the Spanish uh, conquistadors who basically thought they were savages. So obviously, the reality of the Inca is somewhere in between. They were human beings. <clears throat> where did they come from? And where did they, you know, what happened to them? Most stories say that they came from uh, the Lake Titicaca area, which is um, half of it's in Peru and half of it's in Bolivia. And so when you read all of the oral traditions and the Spanish chronicles, you find out that the Island of the Sun, which is in the uh, Bolivian half, is probably one of the places where the um, Inca originated. And this is an Inca-style building. Now, if you look at that, you'll see that it's almost the equivalent of, of some cottages you'll find here. It's basically uh, dry stack stone, or in some cases, they used adobe mud as a mortar because they didn't know cement. Cement came with the Spanish later on. And then here again is another example of an Inca building. But this isn't uh, what you would think of, those who have been to Peru or those who have read about them, of classic Inca. It's supposed to be perfect, you know, almost perfect construction. And this is on the island of the moon, which is next to the island of the sun. And you see this is adobe construction mixed with stone. And that is classic Inca. The Inca were a huge civilization, and they had to, by necessity, build quite rapidly. So the incredible stone constructions would have been not only time consuming, but again, the toolkit isn't there in the, in the archaeological record. But you see examples of this throughout Cusco and the Sacred Valley of Peru. <clears throat> the other possible location is Tiwanaku in Bolivia, which is just south of Lake Titicaca. And this, you know, you look at this and you think, well, my God, that's very sophisticated. But the thing to take into account is that all of this was reconstructed in the 1960s. So the only original stones are the standing stones you see here. Everything else was taken from the surrounding area and reassembled according to what the archaeologists thought this structure uh, looked like. So it's very deceiving. You look at that and you go, oh, my God, that's sophisticated. This is the famous uh, Gate of the Sun, which is at Tiwanaku. 
and that's one solid piece of andesite stone. Um, a human being, you know, can walk through there. And you see the crack that is coming down on that side of it. Um, it was found snapped in two, as if there had been a giant cataclysm at some time in the distant past. Mm -hmm. Some people say the Spanish did that, but the Spanish didn't, didn't break it. It was actually found half sunk in the mud, suggesting that um, it has great antiquity and that some major catastrophe happened in the distant past and destroyed the site. And that's precisely what we find at what's called Puma Punku. Um, amazing shaping of stones, but the whole thing is literally like, you know, like a giant came and picked everything up and threw it all over the place. Most of the stones lean in one direction, and that's towards Lake Titicaca. So it's a, as if a giant wave of mud came and swept through the entire place and just toppled everything over. Also, it's been mined for its materials since uh, the Spanish arrived there up until very recently. So only about 5% of Puma Punku still exists. And this is the sort of thing that still, you know, we can still find there. And you see the astonishing accuracy of this. This is as if a tool came and cut through that material. It's completely even from bottom, bottom till top. And these holes are exactly the same size as if somebody in the distant past had a drill and was able to drill these holes into that stone, which again is between six and seven out of 10 on the hardness scale. And this is uh, how some Germans have uh, reass reassembled uh, what the original stones looked like. And you can see the astonishing complexity. This is not the work of Stone Age people wearing loincloths. It's something from the distant past. I'm not going to give you a timeline because we don't know, but it's, it's an indication that we're missing something in history. And also, these skulls have been found at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku. And you can see that they're um, larger than normal. The cranial volume is also larger than the average human being of today or at that time. So that adds to the mystery. And this is the, again, the depiction of, uh, you know, of the Inca. They were forced out of the Lake Titicaca area about 950 AD as the result of a 50-year 50 uh, year drought. And the Aymara people swept in and forced them to leave. And so what they did, it wasn't just uh, these two. This is Manco Capac and his uh, wife and um, sister, uh, Mama Oklo. They didn't simply flee. They headed north along a road that, pre that uh, existed before them. And I believe they knew exactly where they, were, uh, where they were going based on oral traditions. And this is uh, another depiction. The thing is that the Spanish, um, the king of Spain at the time sent artists to paint the Inca because he wanted to know who these so-called kings were and what they looked like. But unfortunately, more than 90% of the Inca royal family were murdered prior to the Spanish arrival. There was this, a civil war that happened as the result of smallpox. And um, that's why the Spanish had a very easy time of conquering the Inca, was that they were already rapidly crumbling as a civilization. But um, the only surviving people they saw had long black hair and facial features like this, but that is not necessarily a true depiction of what the Inca looked like because the Inca didn't draw themselves.